Hello and welcome to Let the Growth Flow, a spiritual place to heal mind, body, and soul. My name is Alexis and I'll be your host. My hope for this podcast is to help people learn about all things spiritual at the same time allowing themselves to heal in any way that they need to. I plan to do that by sharing my own spiritual experiences as well as bringing other spiritual mentors onto the show. Welcome back to another episode of Let the Growth Flow. Today I have with me mindfulness and meditation writer and teacher David Gherkin. Welcome, David. Thank you, Lexi. Good to be here. Yeah, so uh, kind of a fun story. I think I've talked about this on the podcast. David is actually the father of the family I nanny for. So we kind of have a cool story on how the universe aligned us to work with one another for sure. So we can talk about that a little later, but David, Mm -hmm. I always like to start with your why. So what kind of brought you to where you're at now and to be writing and teaching about mindfulness and meditation? Um, well, it was, it was mainly coming from uh, Los Angeles where I was in the, uh, entertainment business. I was a writer for television and movies and things like that. And it was a tough, as you have heard probably from many people, it's not an easy business. There's zillions of people chasing very few jobs. So in any event, it was just getting harder and harder, uh, making a living and everything. So to deal with that, I started meditating. My sister had been into it for a long time and, uh, suggested I try it. And so I did. And that was in about 2013. And then um, as I got going more and more on it and going deeper into it and really enjoying it, I, I started studying it more. And I sort of came to a point when I was like, you know what, I think it's time for me to get out of the entertainment business and just pursue this. And how I didn't really exactly know. And, uh, you know, for all you listeners out there, a lot of the times there is no um, really precise path. There's just sort of like, you know, I'm really like this stuff. I'm going to figure this out. So that's what I did. And uh, pretty much have been, I wrote a book a few years ago about all meditation and mindfulness, but have sort of held off on it, um, on publishing and trying to just build up an audience first. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but anyway, that's, uh, I've just been writing about it. I'm writing a bunch of articles on medium.com, which has been great. And, uh, and teaching online classes uh, to meditation to various groups of people and It's been going great. Hi. So I have to ask, you said you started in 2013 and we're obviously in 2021 now. So when you started your meditation practice, did it happen overnight or how did that kind of look? Okay. Well, one thing I'll give myself credit for is I have uh, an incredible command of the obvious, which is what my oldest brother, Chip, used to say to me. I know very obvious things. And I knew um, that was a little joke there. <laughs> and I knew that um, that I couldn't just walk into something and go, hey, I think I'll just start meditating today. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew that like most people, I'm human. And that, it, I, so long story short is I literally figured out a plan for myself on how I thought this could work. And the definition of work for me was something I did regularly for the long haul, not just for a week or a month. So what I did was in December of 12, 2012, I'm a big New Year's resolution kind of guy. I, I made this plan in December that I was implemented on January 1, 2013, of, it, it consisted of 
basically five out of seven days a week meditation for the whole year. Wow. And starting slowly, I think I did two or three minutes a day for the first two weeks. And then I went up to I think five minutes and then seven minutes. And I want to say by, let's say, I don't know, eight weeks, maybe 10 weeks, I was up to 15. But I did it gradually. I just thought, I just looked at myself and said, how, what program could I do that would make this as easy as possible to, to be successful? Right. Um, because yeah, a lot of people sort of mistake. They, they think that meditation is so hard. It's so complicated and really it's very simple. It's not, it doesn't mean it's easy. Our minds wander, mm -hmm. but it's, the key is just in the doing of it, which basically means sitting your butt in a chair, at least hopefully five days a week. I'm now doing, I, I dropped the five day thing after about a year. And now, I mean, I probably miss, I don't know, maybe eight or 10 days a year. Yeah. Something like that. Most um, likely probably times when your schedule isn't normal yeah. or when you're not at home, it's yeah, sometimes so more just, difficult. Yeah. And oddly enough, sometimes I actually forget. Yeah. Weird as it may sound. I don't know about you, but you know, there might be one or two days a year where I'll forget to brush my teeth in the morning, mm -hmm. which I do all the time, but something will happen, <laughs> happen and then you go back the rest of the day and you're like, Oh my God, I forgot to brush my teeth. Yeah. yeah or no. I will look back at like five or six o'clock at night every now and then and go, Oh my God, I forgot to meditate. Absolutely. So life, anyway. life starts happening and we lose track. It's all about like the intention. And sometimes we wake up and right, we right. our minds elsewhere. Uh, yes. I really like though, how you started with short amount of times and then mm -hmm. built up because <laughs> there is this misconception around meditating that it's hard. It's difficult that it's impossible to silence your mind. And maybe people go in with too hefty of a goal and say, Hey, I'm going to start daily meditation, 15 minutes every day. Well, when you're going zero to 100 in a sense, 15 minutes is a very long time to sit in silence. Yeah. And that kind of leads me to my next question. When you started meditating and even when you are now, are you sitting in silence or did you ever, or do you ever listen to guided meditations? Oh, well, mostly no, mostly I do my own. Um, but I think my classes that I teach, I record uh, meditations for everybody. And I, I recommend doing guided in the beginning because mm -hmm. it's just easier. Again, my, my sort of philosophy on this stuff is there is no reason to make it any harder than it needs to be. So the way you make it easier is you do very short amounts of time in the beginning. You do it five days a week. So you don't have to like have this pressure of, oh my God, I missed a day. Oh mm -hmm. God, you idiot. Um, and then the other one, but to make it easy is to do guided meditations. Um, and then even to make it easier, easier in those guided meditations, I really, um, I really emphasize what are called body scan mm -hmm. meditations where I'm just saying, you know, place your attention, or sometimes I'll say, breathe into your feet mm -hmm. and I'll let them go for 15 seconds or something like that. And then now breathe into your, your knees or your thighs or whatever. I just, that, because all meditation really is, this is another good thing for your audience to know. It's, it's not some complicated woo woo -y thing. All it really is, is placing your attention on something that is happening in the present moment. Mm -hmm. I, had a, I had a friend, unfortunately, just passed away not long ago, but one of the best tennis players in the world beat John McEnroe, Bory beat everybody. And he was really into this stuff and it really helped his tennis game uh, meditation. And he used to meditate by literally looking, he'd put a tennis ball on the table and he would just look at the tennis ball. Mm -hmm. And if he, his mind wandered, he would just bring his attention back to the tennis ball. That's meditation. 
You can also meditate. Most people meditate by following their breath. And the only reason, you know, that's been around for thousands of years, uh, starting probably in India. There were, that's just because it's, it's something that's kind of easier because it's happening right now. You can't breathe two minutes from now and you can't breathe two minutes ago. It's happening right, right now. Uh, and it's something you can somewhat control by breathing in and breathing out. You, you couldn't really follow your heartbeat because there's really nothing you're doing on that. It's sort of involuntary. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so anyway, that's something for people to realize is don't, don't overthink it. It's just doing something that's in the moment. Yeah. And, and I that, find, yeah, go ahead. well, I was going to say, I find too, that the starting it is sometimes the hardest part for people too. And um, you mean, wait, the start fear the practice that, or the start of a session, the start of like a, a practice, a meditation right. practice. And yeah. I think it is often the fear that they're not going to be able to silence their mind. And I'm reading the power of now currently, yeah. and I'm mm -hmm. only in two chapters right now, I think, but just the idea that our conscious mind can be our worst enemy sometimes. And that's what keeps us from being in the present moment is because we're constantly worrying about the future instead of being yeah. in the present moment, which is all we're promised. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, uh, you, you mentioned something I think a couple times now that is, has to be commented on because it's vital mm -hmm. to being successful in this. And you said, do you, it's so hard to silence the mind. That's really not the goal of meditation. Mm -hmm. It can be a byproduct of doing it can be that your mind does calm down. And yes, my mind does generally calm down a lot more. I do 15 minutes. It's definitely calmer in minutes 10 to 15 than it is one through five. Right. Because that's, it does sort of slow down. But the key to realize is what you're really doing is you're just noticing it's, much, it's not so much silencing the mind as it is noticing the mind. Um, so, cause it, boy, I mean, that's putting so much pressure on people. And this is one big reason people just give up and say, ah, forget it. My mind is crazy. Right. I can't stop my mind. It's impossible. And by the way, uh, Eckhart Tolle who wrote this book you're reading has a, it says this all the time. He says, this gets this question or this comment of people saying, God, you know, I try this stuff. You talk about, you know, our minds and how they just need to be present. And oh, that's impossible for me. My mind is constantly. And he said, well, what are you talking about? You're, you're almost, you're already there. You're noticing that your mind is going crazy. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is a huge thing because most people, are just stuck in their minds all the time and they don't even know that's their reality. Right. What you're really doing is you're stepping back in meditation, your true self, what I call the conscious self, as opposed to what Eckhart would call the egoic self. You're stepping back from that and just observing it and going, wow, okay, there I go. I'm thinking again. Okay, let's just come right back. Let's come back to our breathing. And seven seconds later, whoop, there I go again. I'm thinking about whether I made a reservation for lunch today. Well, okay, just coming back. When you, when you consistently do that over weeks, months, and years, what happens is, I'll just give you my quickie on this thing because this is central to the entire uh, universe of this topic. We all have these two sort of entities in us. This egoic self, which is the mind. It's, I'm not smart enough. I'm not beautiful enough. I'm, or I am so unbelievably hot and perfect. It's all, it's all the things that you are telling yourself that you are. And it's, and it's, and it's sort of is developed as kids as we sort of start to learn about the world and it's a way of sort of almost 
defending ourselves, but mm -hmm. then it becomes really not something that's helpful as right. we go along in life. So you have this entity, and let's just call this entity, it's like this big, it's massive, and it is so powerful. It's so powerful that most people think that that's all they have is this crazy mind. But in fact, you also have what I will call the conscious self, the true self. It, you can talk about it in many ways. You, some people would it, go so far as it's the spirit. It's, that's, it's the real you that unfortunately is enveloped by this massive thing all the time. Mm -hmm. and the egoic self. Yeah, by the egoic self. And so what we're doing in meditation and mindfulness, the, uh, this is one way of explaining the whole ball of wax, is we are sort of freeing this conscious self from the clutches of this egoic self and just slowly trying to separate it. And at first, and what it's really about is just observing this thing you're just observing it. And the more you observe it, the sort of the less power this thing has. And, it, and, and this doesn't happen in a day, a week, a right. month, years and years and years. But the good news is it's gradual. So you just like, for me, it's what, eight years in. And I just feel, you know, with each month, year, I just get, there's this great sort of incremental growth you have where the real, I, I always put it this way in my writing, the real you is more in the driver's seat of your life than the crazy mind. You know, mm -hmm. right now, the, that mind is driving every day, almost all the time, my driving you crazy, so to speak, driving you crazy. And the real conscious you is like stuck in a trunk. Right. And barely involved. And so that's what these practices are about is essentially strengthening that real conscious, true you. And at the same time, sort of diminishing the influence of that egoic you. Right. So really becoming the ultimate observer, yeah. right. With your, of yourself and yeah. of yourself and the egoic self. So yeah, yeah. I do like that. And I, I like that explanation better for sure than saying let's quiet our mind because as you said that is what turns so many people off including my own mom whenever I talk to her about meditating yeah. she's like I just can't do it because my mind isn't quiet and I often do tell her I'm like your mind doesn't have to be quiet like you can still have thoughts pop in but yeah. it's being aware that when those thoughts pop in they're most likely thoughts of things that you're worrying about things that are have yet to come you're worrying about the past or the future so bring your attention back to breathing or onto your ankles or onto your feet, wherever yeah. you're at in a body scan, even, yeah. um, because it's a simple practice, but the way it can make us show up in our day-to-day -day life is insanely beneficial also. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's just, you know, and by the way, this is what I have, what I just said about, you know, the two selves and it's, I've, I've done all the reading. I've, I've looked into Hinduism and Buddhism and frankly, everything. And they're really mostly all saying the same thing. You know, the, the Buddhists would say that we all have the Atman inside of us, which is basically our own little slice of God, essentially is what it comes right. down to. And that sort of is the true self we're all born with, but then we all develop all this stuff. So what Buddhism is basically saying is, let's just meditate, let's quiet that mind, let's, let's eventually, uh, and just sort of re-inhabit uh, or let that Atman sort of become the thing that is ruling your your, uh, your life. And right. it's a good thing. I mean, it's this is where, you know, you see people who've really gone far in this stuff. And some of them are these, you know, saints, they call them in India, who are just remarkable people. I mean, they they pretty much lost their egos. Mm -hmm. and, and I have never met one, but I've seen them on shows and things or, you know, in movies, whatever. But what people will say who come into contact with them, sometimes people just start crying right. when they come into contact with someone like it. Cause they just, and they say the same thing. It's all these people. They say the same thing. They say, 
it's so weird. I just felt this like pure love coming from this person. I can't explain it. It just was so amazing. Mm -hmm. And they're just pure goodness. And so, and that comes from just getting rid of yourself. Right. You know, um, and a lot of times it scares people like, I don't want to get rid of myself. I like a lot of, I, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. Um, but, but it's an, it's an idea. It's like a con, a con, I don't know if that's the right word I want to use. I want to say conception, but there's, it's an idea of what or who you are. Yeah. So we are nothing yeah. at the same time. Um, right. And that can be an extremely scary thought. I yeah. like feel also like this is almost drawn back in because there's so many different um, terms coined for all of this now. Um, and like collective consciousness also, are you familiar with that term? You mean, uh, like the Carl Jung thing, um, the famous Carl Jung psychology, the collective consciousness, meaning like that sort of the, we're all sort of part of it. Yeah, like we're all part of it. Like we're all one, like I am you and you are me. So yeah, yeah. Oh, well, kind that's of like the amazing. same thing where it's like this endless love that we send out, like anything that you send out into the universe is being directly reflected back to you. So it's like, yeah. you can either choose to send love and light or hatred and anger but whatever you send out is most likely going to the person you directed it to but also everyone else around you and in return yourself yeah. so for here, me, i'll show you i'll show you really quick this guy right here i'm seeing okay miracle of love who wrote it yeah this is a guy um i won't get into it too much because we could literally spend five hours talking just about this guy who i've just been reading about and um, but suffice it to say that, uh, he is one of these, I've, I've studied a lot of these sort of saints. He is the one that I'm most like bowled over by, um, just a really, just a great guy who is exactly the kind of person where people would just see him and just be like, anyway, um, but he would say there's a very famous guy in the U S who died a few years ago named Ram Das, mm. who um, he wrote Be Here Now, which is one of the seminal spiritual books of the last 50 years. Um, but that's was his guru. He's the guy who got him into this whole thing. And Ram Das, by the way, his name was Richard Alpert. He just he was given that new name by this guy. But he used to say, coming back to your point about the, you know, it's the collective consciousness and we're all one. Ram Das said that this guy, Neem Karoli Baba, used to say time and again, he'd just say, Subek, Subek, which in, I um, can't remember what language it is, one of the Indian dialects mm -hmm. that means all one, all one, mm -hmm. all one, we're all one, all one. So that was like his, that sort of is a central, central, um, concept in all of these spiritual traditions is that we all come from one we all return to that the one, one. Mm -hmm. when we're when we die and uh, and that therefore we are all really are one and wow. that when these people do make it along like thousands of miles ahead of me on this spiritual path these people who've really sort of meditated for hours and hours and hours a day for decades and et cetera, et cetera. They actually start to feel that. It's not a concept of, oh, we're all one. Mm -hmm. They will Feeling. actually look at you and they'll just sort of see themselves in you and, you know, and they, they sort of feel the, the oneness of everything. It's sort of like that final step. And apparently it's just fantastic. It's like, hey, look, we're all in this together. We're all, you know, we're all from one thing and we're all going right. back to the same one thing. And uh, anyway. Well, no, and that's interesting because I am taking this mediumship development course right now, as you know, so do the listeners, I've talked about it, but my teacher says this interesting thing and it was in a book she read once and I'm blanking on the book, but just basically that mediumship is connecting to another conscious thought because it's all up in this collective it's a conscious thought, a conscious memory, and it's just connecting with that. So I don't, there's just so much that amazes me how in the word, like 
what keeps coming to my mind is it's all connected to it just always amazes me we kind of got off base from meditation but i like this um well, but it's all connected though it's exactly all, it's all connected meditation is just something that helps uh eventually realize the oneness of everything and, and on and on and on mm -hmm. I wanted to ask too, like, what is the biggest thing you saw within yourself that changed like your day-to-day -day life of the David pre-meditation and the David mm -hmm. after meditation oh, that's or during? Um, well, you could ask Steph this. <laughs> Steph uh, is his wife, I, by the I, way. <laughs> I actually wrote an article about this a few years ago and I, or no, maybe it was part of the book. I can't remember, but as I was writing it, I called her and I said, this would be kind of cool as I'm going to write this as you tell me this. I said, so just tell me, like, how do you feel like I've changed as a husband, you know, um, since we I got going on this stuff? And mm -hmm. Her response was something to the effect of definitely, you know, way more patient. Um, with her and the kids because that's been one of my sort of the uh, uh, not one of my favorite traits uh, myself since I was literally three or four years old I've always been just really impatient let's go let's go why, why mm -hmm. are you waiting mm -hmm. um, and that's really helped me it's helped me with that um, it's helped me just, this is gonna be a hard one to explain, but I'll do as best I can. I just feel lighter in general, but especially in my head, mm -hmm. just feel lighter. Um, and it's as opposed to heavier. Right. And there's just, it's just a really, you know, you just, I don't worry as much. Um, I will say too, though, that I'm not one of these people that is sort of absolute on this that It's not like I'm perfect. Right. Or not. It's just that I'm, I'm just sort of better. And a lot of people will have said to me over the last years, like you just seem, I mean, not that I was a total jerk or anything. I don't think I ever was, but they say you just seem a lot nicer and just more compassionate. Yeah. Um, and I think that's definitely a byproduct of this work. Well, and like having that discernment too, to realize almost inside of yourself when there's something that triggers you that you want to have this big blow up and you can say, okay, but I'm going to choose not to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what it is too, at the same time, because we're bringing awareness. And you said something that I really want to touch on is that you said, I'm not perfect. And mm -hmm. there's this huge, I feel like idea around spiritual people and people who are practicing and teaching mindfulness and meditation that they're perfect, that they don't anger, that they don't have emotions, that they don't explode sometimes. And like, I'm here to say that's not true. And I feel like you would say the same thing because it's like, we're not emotionless beings. Right. We become more aware of them but that still doesn't mean there's not times that i'm angry or i'm sad um i just think that's important to touch on because i do think that's a misconception yeah no it's uh and anyone who sort of does propose that they are there are some i think i don't think probably eckhart tolle loses his you know what like probably ever um there are certain people who are really far along, but most people, and, and most of the true blue ones, I'll name some names, like there's the sort of what I call the meditation or spiritual elite. Mm -hmm. And I almost, that almost sounds um, pejorative and it's really not. Cause I think, I think all these people, I don't agree with every single thing they say or their approach and everything, but I think every single one of them to me is just a really cool neat person who's mm -hmm. devoted themselves to just great stuff like tara brock jack cornfield um certainly eckhart um there's a guy you should check out and all your people should check out john cabot zinn he's fantastic um anyway 
but they would all say, yeah, no, we have, um, we're real people. Um, we have our ups and downs. And that brings up a really important point for you and for your listeners is a lot of people think that the goal of mindfulness and the goal of meditation is to just feel absolutely perfect and calm and cool and collected all the time. And again, that can be a byproduct. But the problem is if you go in wanting that from it, it will normally elude you. What it's what they will say, especially like, you know, the real true blue proponents of mindfulness and all that stuff, like John Cabot Zinn, what they will say is that what you're really shooting to do is be present for the moments of your life. And sometimes those moments suck, you know, but oftentimes, you know, oftentimes, you know, we've had discussions about this where sometimes, you know, life can be really hard. And what most people will do is sort of push it and, and either avoid it, which is really not healthy and, 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 and doesn't, when I say not healthy, I mean, it's not good for you. Right. It makes things worse. And so what they're saying in the whole mindfulness world is, you know what, be present if, you know, if something really, you know, you got someone broke up with you or whatever, be present with that. Mm -hmm. And it's painful and acknowledge the pain and be right. with the pain, but don't. And it's, and as, and I, as I've told you, this is one of the greatest benefits I've gotten out of this whole thing is being better able to deal with not resisting those tough times, but actually almost meditating on them, like putting my attention on God, I really don't feel that good right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you don't say, Oh, woe is me. You don't do anything. You just acknowledge, okay, I feel terrible right now. Mm -hmm. And you sit with it. You don't push it away. You just sit with it. And, and boy, it's sort of like, Many of these teachers like Eckhart and others use this great analogy of it's almost like a dark cloud has moved in over your head and is pouring rain on you. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really not good. And what most people do is they engage with it and they say, oh, God, what is wrong? Oh, yes. God, I hate this. And, they're, and what does that do? It keeps the thing right over your head mm -hmm. pouring rain on you. Whereas if you just look at it and go, okay, you're there. I don't hate you. I just acknowledge you. And you're just there. What mm -hmm. happens is that cloud starts slowly moving past over your head and it goes. Right. Um, so right there, I just sort of summed up how just the tough times of your life can be made so much less tough by doing this kind of stuff. Right. Just being present with it, not fighting and resisting and all that stuff. Not fighting and resisting. And like you said, almost interacting with it or like feeding into it. Yeah. Where you're like reaching up into these dark clouds and like pulling yeah. more darkness out with it, where it's like, okay, I'm sad right now. Let me pull out every other sad thing that's happened and just get even more and more sad. Yeah. Um, I'm super open on this podcast because it's what has led me to exactly where I'm at in life. But um, I have discussed on here before how I am a sexual assault survivor and my father's an alcoholic. And I feel like just now, like years of talking therapy and it's like, I've been told the same things on like this, like separate yourself, like allow yourself to feel it, but don't engage so much in it. And it's like refreshing to almost when, like you said, being present in these moments, even when they're not good or something bad can be happening and you can have the ability to sit there and say, okay, here's what's going on in my life right now. It sucks. It's making me feel X, Y, Z, but I'm still okay. Yeah. And I can feel these emotions and still yeah. be okay and not have it. Let me like, not let myself spiral down and keep in interacting and engaging with this, so to speak, dark cloud above me. Yeah. And it's an, an empowering place to be. So I think oh, yeah. that is the importance of it. Yeah, it is. I mean, uh, there's another teacher that all that you and all of your listeners should know about because he's basically been my favorite teacher for the last couple of years. 
His name is Michael Singer. He's um, his big best-selling book is called The Untethered Soul, which oh, yeah. a lot of people have probably heard of. It's a big New York Times best-selling thing for years, but um, that's a big part of his teaching is you know that you do just have to be okay get to the point where you're stuck we all have stuff we all have triggers we all have things that it's from that egoic development of ourselves way all throughout and the stuff is just stuck in there and eventually you just want to get to the point where you're okay with any of it when it comes up right and eventually when stuff comes up and you just do what we've been talking about. You don't grapple with it, you watch it. And what that eventually does is it frees it because it's basically stuck. I, I hate to even get sort of up down, but for me, it's like everything is stuck in the, the stomach, mm -hmm. abdomen type area. That's where you build you know, anxiety and all that kind of stuff. But it, it's just sort of frees that energy. It's all just energy to just sort of flow up rather than being stuck right there, which is what makes us feel not great. Right. Which all sounds like crazy, you know, sort of, um, well, actually you're a- Yeah, you're no, it's crazy. not crazy at you all to me. You get all the energy stuff for yeah. sure. Yeah, your, your job is I'm sure to help people free that energy so that it can flow up. Yeah, or down or wherever right. it needs to go. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, no, and I, I, which brings up something interesting for you too um like when you're saying yours you always feel yours in your stomach which is like your shoulder plexus area i mm -hmm. am learning about human design right now have you heard that before have human you heard design? Of human design no so i'm bringing it up to like everybody these days because i'm still learning about it but i think it's great well and i know you're not super into astrology either but it is kind of based off of that and how mm -hmm. when you were born like the time and all of that but it will tell you your personality traits based on all of this too. And we all kind of have like a powerhouse within our energetic body and solar plexus could be your powerhouse too. So it's where maybe you hold on to your worries and anxiety, but also maybe when you're excited or you are determined, it's also radiating from that mm -hmm. stomach area too. Yeah. So it's something interesting for you to try out. You can, you can do like free, um, I get a free workup online and then you can pay people to dig deeper into everything. But it's really beneficial with how, with running a business too, because it'll tell you like your best way to work and like mm -hmm. how to respect your, the way that you work instead of fighting against it. But uh, there's one more question I wanted to kind of bring up pertaining to meditation. And mm -hmm. I don't know how familiar you are with like, there's tons of guided meditations on YouTube and there's like, you know, there's apps. I think Insight Timer is one of the most popular ones. I use that. Yeah. So yeah. I love Insight Timer because you can time yourself and have like the silence. But there's one thing that I wanted to speak on, and that's the seeking within meditation, especially the guided meditations where it's like guided meditation to maybe meet your higher self, guided meditation to clear anxiety, where it's like you're seeking, seeking, seeking. Mm -hmm. Um I guess I've run into issues with that. And that's why I'm asking maybe just your opinion on it, where it's like, I'm going in already seeking something when almost, I guess to me, I feel like when I've learned now that meditating is about being and not actively seeking. So what are, what's, what are your thoughts on that? Oh God, I completely agree with you. If you, I've, in my classes, I teach this all the time that, you know, when you're going into some meditation, um, seeking as you call it other the buddhists would call it striving whatever it's 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 i i want to i want to get something mm -hmm. that's a problem i'll tell you a really great story from one of the great pioneers of meditation in america who really got it going here in the 60s and 70s as a younger guy still around joseph goldstein this is his name he's a wonderful guy and he tells this great story about when he went to India one of these times, I think in the early 70s, and, and just was there for a few months and had these just extraordinary highs from his meditations. He said he got places where he was like, oh my God, 
just fantastic. Mm -hmm. So he comes home to the States for a while and then he goes back and he can't wait. He's just so ready to just get back there and just, oh. And it was some, it was the worst meditations he'd had in his entire life. He called it, it was like twisted steel inside himself. And he said he learned a fantastic lesson, which is meditation is not about getting anywhere. It's about basically just being with what is in the present moment. And sometimes what is, is anxiety and it's, I don't feel good. Sometimes it's pure bliss, but whatever it is, your only, let's call it task, is to just be there non-judgmentally with what is. Mm -hmm. So uh, that sort of gets to your point about seeking. No, if you're sitting there going, God, it's like seven minutes and I, you know, and I still don't feel good. What the hell? Right it's going to elude you. Um, it's all just about the good stuff happens from a place of, I'm just going to sit here as you great word, just sitting here and being mm -hmm. you know, there's doing and being. And most of the time we're doing and what most of these great people are trying to do is get to the place where their life is spent in just being mm -hmm. that's presence. That's when you're present, you're just being, you're not like, this, that in America, that's especially important where everyone is taught to go, 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 do, yeah. do, do. Um, Gosh, yeah, the way of life in other places yeah. is, it's like almost shocking. Yeah, but it's ironic too. And I, 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 I really emphasize this in my writings and in my classes that, that doing things from a place of being and more from a present standpoint is far superior in like every single way than just that sort of, you know, pressing and doing and uh, uh, tightness that yeah. most people are taught at law firms and hospitals, you name it, wherever. Um, I can tell it to you also from the standpoint of an athlete, you know, I was a really serious tennis player back in the day and played in college and um, pro a little short while. And you can't sit around thinking when you're in a tennis match, you're on autopilot. Mm -hmm. You know, you are just sort of like when you're playing, I used to hit some shots and I would literally say to myself in my head, I have no idea how I just did. <laughs> and it's because I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. it that genius conscious self, that true genius that is inside all of us mm -hmm. um, in all of us, really. I mean, it's, that's why that's sort of the, optimistic thing about this whole thing we all have it we just have to sort of peel away all that egoic gunk that is sort of obstructing our path to that thing that's inside us um but um anyway so yeah i completely agree with that and i kind of would just love if you could leave it with listeners kind of just tips on starting a practice what's your what are your go-to tips for starting a meditation practice i know we kind of touched on this at the beginning too so it's okay if it's the same yeah okay i'll go through it as quickly as i can um start well first of all you, you there's two things you need to do before you even have one second of meditation and do this first one commit to yourself that you're going to do two months of meditation and you're going to do it five days out of seven each week. And the way you're going to know is I like the old fashioned way. You're going to get out a little card and you're going to write them a, a whole month down with weeks, four weeks on there, mm -hmm. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever. And you're going to check off. Oop, I did it Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. I missed Wednesday. I did Friday, I missed Sunday, but I did Saturday. Okay, that's five. And you're going to keep track. That's huge. You, know, you need to give yourself some accountability and it helps. The second thing you have to do with the, the commitment is you need to figure out a time of day that is going to work. Mm. If you don't do that, I don't care how committed you are. If you just say, okay, so today, let's see, today, 
I've got to do errands in the morning. Got to get my kid to school. So probably not a good time to do in the morning. I think I'm going to shoot for afternoon today. Tomorrow, it's something else. It never will work. It's too much on you to have to, you, what you need to do is find some time of day that will work most every day. Mm-hmm. And for me and for most people, that is in the morning. And hopefully it's the morning. It doesn't have to be, but morning is a great time to do it. It doesn't have to be right when you get up at seven right. a.m. or anything like that. I don't like, do it. It can be after you get the kids to school. Yeah. In fact, that's usually better than you're less right. stressed. Um, and so you got to just figure out that day. When you do it in the morning, what, what it has the effect of is it sort of can just help set the tone for the rest of the day where let's say you did meditate for your 15 minutes and at 11.30 that morning, your boss lobbed some snide comment your way. If you didn't meditate, it might really sort of just penetrate. Mm -hmm. If you did meditate, it might, it may, it's not going to be perfect, but you may not just like throw you off for the rest of the day. It'll, it it just brings up just this bit of strength it sort of gives you this inner strength on a daily basis. And it's, if you do it in the morning, it, that's when you get it in and it's just sort of there for the rest of the day. Mm-hmm. Um, so those two things you got to do, commit at least two months and then pick a time of day that works. Start incredibly slowly, do two minutes a day on Insight Timer, just download insighttimer.com, it's free. You can just get these little timing things, you can figure it out. And then um, just go gradually. I, it's part of my plan it's, is what I did for myself. And I've written about it in books and stuff. You know, two minutes for the first two weeks, five minutes for the next two weeks after that, seven minutes, then 10 minutes, then 12 minutes, then 15 minutes, all, you know, probably a couple weeks each of those. And just go gradually. Mm-hmm. Uh, and do five out of seven days and just stay with it. And I always tell people there's nothing, and it sounds highbrow, not highbrow, but um, maybe exaggerating, but I literally believe there's nothing more important that people could do for themselves than develop a meditation practice because of my belief that getting quiet inside, helping yourself sort of get more quiet, quieting down your mind gradually over time is literally the most valuable thing that any human can do because it helps them in everything else. And the pyramid, you know, right. it's, it's here and it just rains down goodness on everything else, your relationships, yeah. your work, you know, um, the way you are and your with your families, everything, everything gets better. Your sports get better, everything by quieting down and letting that sort of conscious self have more of a say in your life. Absolutely. Well, yeah. thank you so much for sharing that and for joining us here today. I just loved having a chance to talk about this and to kind of, I want to say debunk some beliefs about meditation. So hopefully our listeners can see that it's not as hard as it is and you don't have to start with something huge. It can be as simple as starting with a minute or two and building up. So I appreciate that. And if you would like to plug your website so people know where to find you. Oh yeah. Just davidgerkin.net. Perfect. And I will add that to the show notes also. Thank you so much, David. All right. So super fun episode with David today. Um, He has so much knowledge about mindfulness and meditation and just loved having the chance to have him on and hear the way his brain thinks and just all his tips for meditation and how real he keeps it. I appreciate it so much. I I do hope that you guys gained from today's episode that you can start a meditation practice and it can be three minutes and you can still gain so much from that and it's all practice. Everything is practice. Start where you can, like meet yourself where you're at and grow from there. But I am going to share this story really quickly of how David 
and I crossed paths. So yeah, I nanny part-time for his family and it's so funny. I interviewed with them in when I was still living in Nebraska and the interview went so well. Uh, we were our, his wife, um, who I might have on the show too, because she does the Marie Kondo organizing and that's all about energy too. But um, we were laughing the whole time, just enjoying ourselves, cracking jokes, like really bonding. And they were super into the Reiki and mediumship. They were asking me all these questions and David was telling me how he's a mindfulness meditation teacher and just all the things. And I was like, oh, I feel like I have this job in the bag. Like, this is going to be great, like, to be so aligned with a family. Well, it turned out that they went with somebody else. And I was so sad. But, you know, I kept my hopes up that I was going to find the right job. And um, I actually did find a nanny job in California. And I worked for them for a week. And then energetically, it wasn't feeling like a match for me. Um, The mom was very high strung, uh, kind of like helicopter parent, was constantly following me around. And that stressed me out. And we just, I just, we weren't connecting. So after a week um, of that, she kind of was like, you know, this isn't working. Like we can't afford a a second nanny because I was their second nanny too. Um, But I was applying to all these nannying jobs. I had so many other interviews and I just, everything was following through. And I have, my education background is elementary education and special education. I've worked with kids since I was 11, like since I was a kid. And I was like, oh my gosh, what is happening? So I prayed to the universe and to my spirit guides. And I just said, I need you guys to show me the job that's in my highest alignment because I don't know what to do. I feel lost. And if it isn't nannying, please show me the right job. And like, An hour later, David had texted me saying that after two weeks, their nanny just up and quit on them and that they need a nanny. So the next day, I think I went to their house and we kind of had a second interview and went over details and plans and I've been working for them since. So it's been about three months now and yeah, great family and as you can see, great vibes. So I'm really lucky to be surrounded by that outside of my Reiki and mediumship. But I did want to share that story because we were divinely guided to work with one another. Uh, So I do feel blessed. And I do want to pull a card for you guys today. And I am pulling from the Earth Warriors Oracle by Alana Fairchild. So I always preface this by saying this is my more woo-woo-y deck, my more spiritual deck. So uh, Bear with me if this is too spiritual for you and also be ready with a pen and paper because sometimes these are long, the definitions from the book. But I was feeling drawn to to pull from this deck for you guys. All right. And of course, I feel like it's like a super, super woo card. Uh, okay. So we have Mayu, Soma from the Galactic Heart. The Divine Mother's Milk of the Galaxy is feeding your soul expansion of your horizons your spiritual purpose and your sacred responsibilities is taking place divine potential within you is awakening at a higher turn of the creative spiral of consciousness this oracle is prophecy of ascension and grace so i am going to read the shorter portion of it which is in a reading the spiritual guidance one is like four pages long um so I may post that one to my Instagram if you guys are interested to go read the extended version. So the inner reading message is, Your soul has been going through a deep spiritual feeding process and is growing rapidly. The evidence of this is in the outer world will be a sense of expansion of opportunity, reach connections, and new levels of spiritual experiences. This oracle foretells the welcoming in of a new phase in life. Newborn energies and fertility, whether biological, creative, or psychological, are being stimulated. The oracle indicates the discovery, development, and expression of talents. An increasingly public profile which moves you into the spotlight can help you fulfill your divine life mission, provided that you keep your inner connection to spirit as the highest priority. The oracle speaks of soul healing around matters of trust, spirit, mother, and abundance. Very interesting. 
if you guys follow along the weekly energy that I posted earlier this week to Instagram and Facebook uh, was kind of talking about how we would gain massive clarity this week and that this would be a really good week for us um, in vitality, health, and clarity, um, but that we might also face some obstacles at the same time, some emotional obstacles. So just remembering to trust and believe, I feel like that has been our constant message lately, trust and believe that everything that's happening is meant to and just try your best not to control it instead surrender very beautiful i will post the spiritual guidance portion on my instagram um, story also the day that this is posted so if you miss it i'm so sorry thank you so much for listening as always i appreciate you all i uh, if you are looking to book a virtual reiki or mediumship appointment you can do so on my website Alexis East Intuitive Healing or through the link in my Instagram bio at Alexis East. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful week. Until next time. Bye.